Well, shalom, shalom. I am Rebecca Kaha Bachehova from Teshuvah Ministries, and welcome to my 2021 summer series, Flat Earth Deception. So today's uh, topic I'm actually excited about, and I'm gonna explain it in a little bit. But first, some housekeeping details. Please like this video. I think you're gonna like this video. And then definitely subscribe to our YouTube, cha YouTube channel. Click the bell so you get notified of when number eight comes, because this is number seven in the series. Did I just say that? <laughs> anyway. Um, and then definitely please go to tissueministries.com, our website, and click on the join us, um, like in the navigation bar, the little join us tab, and uh, give us your email address so that we can stay in touch uh, as the world kind of goes crazy. This script from this uh, series, as well as my daughter's um, study on Flat Earth, will be in the Kingdom University vault. So if you go over to our website again, you'll look at the top navigation bar and you'll see KU or Kingdom University there. So click on that and it will take you over to the university. And there you can get into the vault for very cheap. You can, and there's so many things in the vault, as I've said before for you, um, but definitely take a course. Not only does it support us, but also uh, you're going to be part of our, uh, our, new, our growing university and you will learn a lot about Yehovah's feasts and festivals and how to obey and how to repent. Okay. Uh, oh, speaking of repentance, I do have a Ladies of Teshuva um, group. It is a pri basically private group for women all over the world to come together at, in repentance as they are repenting and learning how. Um, it's a great support group and we're making friends there, praying for each other. So there should be links below in the description. Oh yes, support. <laughs> Please support us financially. This is a one family show, as I've said before, with a few handfuls of volunteers now and then to help us in the ladies group. But other than that, it is our family. We have basically sacrificed a lot to um, be doing a ministry full time. So um, if you don't know everything that we do, there should be a trailer that I just made uh, a little doodly uh, about what we do as a family for um, Yehovah. So uh, do support us with your offerings. Um, monthly support is fantastic because uh, that is what we need is consistent support so we can continue to do this. So thank you for that. This is number seven in my 2021 series. Uh, last video in number six, we talked about history and witnesses or the lack thereof and photographs. So in the power of, of those. All right, so in this video today, we are gonna talk about, this is gonna be my favorite one, I think. Because <laughs> we're gonna talk about the blue marble. We're gonna talk about my reaction to it. And then we're gonna talk about being the center of the universe. Are we or are we not? All right, so let's get started. said earlier in the other videos I said something was coming something that uh, you know changed my attitude this is the video for that so basically studying the flat earth for the last month or whatever it's been now it's I mean it's been dragging on quite a bit but studying the flat earth this summer and all the nonsense really just oh, as I was doing the research it really made me feel yucky you know it was it made me feel like I was unclean and I really felt dirty plowing through all the nonsense and the lies. And I actually really just wanted to just go mikvah and be done with it <laughs> and get clean again. But as I was doing this and thinking about my audience and thinking about you, as well as my own heart, as I was going into this, I decided to include what is true. So as you notice behind me in all these videos, I have on the green screen 
um, footage, real footage. This is like real footage. This isn't CGI, this isn't Photoshop, this is actual real footage from trusted sources from space looking back at our planet. So be, and they're either photographs or they're videos from different times. And so on each of the videos that are behind me playing on the green screen, I have a caption and those captions tell where I got this information from, where I got this footage from, the date it happens, who took it, happened who took it and where, you know, it just as documented. So I wanted you to see what is true and what is real, not is real, is real. <laughs> I wanted you to see what is real. Israel. <laughs> All right. Um, so I decided to include what is real, not just for my sake, but also for yours. So in that process of trying to figure out how to approach this, I remembered how important witnesses are to Yehovah, as we talked about in uh, the video before. So I began to research 21st century eyewitness accounts of our earth and frankly it has completely rescued me and when I discovered it, uh, it seems like for the first time it filled my heart with joy and hope and brought back, you know, so much to my heart. It, it really made me fall to my knees and shed tears this last uh, week when I was doing this. So here we go. I'm going to share with you what I discovered this week. Not just, it's like I discovered it again for the first time, honestly. I knew about this, but I didn't know it as much as I do now. So in the film Earthrise, the story of the photo that changed the world, you can look this up yourself, um, by National Geographic, they said that on uh, December 21, 1968, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders, the three NASA astronauts of Apollo 8, became the first humans to orbit the moon. So they, their mission was to just orbit the moon 10 times and to basically find a landing spot for one of their future missions. And they gave absolutely no um, thought to the fact that they were actually going to see Earth. <laughs> um, but little did they know that their voyage would be forever known by the photograph that Bill Anders took from the spaceship back to Earth is quite an amazing photo and it is right here behind me. This is the, he took one in black and white and then the second one in color and we're gonna talk extensively about these photographs in a second. Now I could just probably ramble this off of what I remember uh, from my experience with this and what I learned, but I'm going to uh, consult my notes here because there's a lot of details that I want to uh, make sure that you have. So according to the National Geographic film, uh, this was the photograph that forever changed the way we saw ourselves. This photo that was taken in 1968 was called Earthrise, uh, which basically means that they witnessed the Earth rising above the horizon of the moon, just like we witnessed the moon rising over our horizon. It was just flipped. Okay, I do want to make a note here and point out something and change my photo in the background here real quick in that there was actually uh, another photo taken of Earth in 19, I think it was 66. This was a satellite that went around the moon in 1966 and this is the photo that, that, that was taken at that point. And I believe that it was, has been a little bit remastered because it was really, it's a, it was old. <laughs> it was an old film, old camera and whatnot, but Anyway, so I just wanted to do, I just wanted to make note of that in case I don't later on in this video. All right, so after years of working on this project, NASA sent Apollo 8 into space to orbit the moon 10 times and then to return home. 
at 2 p.m. on December 22, 1968, the second day of the mission, and TV networks interrupted Sunday programming for the first televised broadcast from Apollo 8. Very good. Okay, Apollo 8, we have a good picture. Rolling around. Okay, we're watching. rolling around to a uh, good view of the Earth. And uh, as soon as we get to the uh, good view of the Earth, we'll stop and let you look out the window at the scene we see. Okay, now we're coming up on the view. We really want you to see us the view of the Earth. And if you'll uh, break for just a minute, uh, Bill's going to put on the large lens. So we'll be right back with you. Okay, thank you. Apollo 8, uh, we have a picture now. Okay, slice. let's try the other lens again then once again. Okay, thank you. That works right. I still report no joy. There's a picture. Picture, uh, okay, it's a little difficult to see what we have. That's the Earth, but it's not the telephoto lens, unfortunately. It's just a regular inside lens. Okay, it's coming in as a, a real bright, uh, real bright uh, blob on the screen. It's hard to tell what we're looking at. Well, you're looking through uh, some haze on the window too, unfortunately. And the Earth is very bright besides. Okay, we've got the, the Earth uh, in about the center of the screen and a little bit low, and it looked like there were some objects that moved across it, the screen at the same time. Do you have any comment on those? That's from a uh, water, some water uh, ice coming off the vent nozzle. Uh, Roger. How does it look now? Uh, it's still the same thing. It's, uh, the target is extremely bright. Yeah, it's never very difficult to they make out what we're looking at. AOC is on in the camera. Uh, uh, what is the AOC? We don't have the, uh, we can't make the other lens work here. I Automatic know flight control. Capcom flight. Can you ask okay, a question? Oh, uh, would you verify that the AOC is on? Okay, we're going to have to stop and let you know what we're getting now is a good picture. Capcom asked them to go ahead and just leave it inside the spacecraft until we can think some more about what's wrong with that long lens. Okay, that's a, that's a real good picture. That's the best one we've had. And uh, how about just going ahead and leave your pictures inside until we can uh, think some more about what we can do to adjust for that light. Roger. In the film Earthrise, the first lunar voyage, it documents that instantly, quote, their focus changed. After traveling nearly a quarter of a million miles to explore the moon, the astronauts unexpectedly found themselves gazing back at the Earth, captivated by their own home planet, end of quote. So Frank Borman, in an interview after uh, landing, he said that, quote, the moon 
was a terribly distraught landscape. It was the most awe-inspiring moment of the flight when we looked up and there coming over the lunar horizon was the Earth. It was the only object in the, in the universe that had any color to it, basically blue with white clouds. Everything that we held dear was back there. It was a long way away. End quote. Uh, Apollo 8, this is Houston. Roger, 169.1 by 60.5. Good to hear your voice. So what you're seeing is the Western Hemisphere looking at the top is the North Pole. In the center, just lower to the center, is South America. All the way down to Cape Horn. I can see Baja, California, and uh, the southwestern part of the United States. There's a big fog cloud bank going northeast. Covers a lot of the Gulf of Mexico, going up to the eastern part of the United States. And it appears now that the east coast is cloudy. I can see clouds over uh, parts of Mexico. The parts of Central America are clear. And we can also see the light bright spot of the uh, subsolar point on the light side of the uh, Earth. Okay, for colors, the waters are all a sort of a royal blue. Clouds, of course, are uh, bright white. The reflection off the Earth is uh, appears much greater than the moon. Uh, the land areas are generally a brownish, uh, sort of dark brownish uh, to light brown in, in uh, texture. Many of uh, the vortices of clouds can be seen of uh, various weather cells. And that long band of uh, appears serious the clouds that extend uh, from the entrance to the uh, Gulf of Mexico going straight out across the Atlantic. The Terminator, of course, cuts through the Atlantic Ocean right now, going from north to south. The southern hemisphere is almost completely clouded over, and uh, up near the North Pole, there's quite a few clouds. South, uh, southwestern Texas and southwestern United States is clear. I'd say there's some clouds up in the northwest and over uh, in the uh, northeast portion. This is Apollo 8 uh, coming to you live from the moon. We've had to switch the TV camera now. We showed you first a view of Earth as we've been watching it for the past 16 hours. Now we're switching so that we can show you the moon that we've been flying over at 60 miles altitude for the last 16 hours. I think that each one of us, I think that each one of uh, each one uh, carries his own impressions of what, of what he's seen today. I know my own impression is that it's a, a vast, lonely, forbidding type existence or expanse of nothing. It looks rather like clouds and clouds of pumice stone. Certainly would not appear to be a very inviting place to to live or work. Jim, what have you uh, thought most about? Well, Frank, my thoughts were very similar. The vast loneliness up here on the moon is uh, awe-inspiring, and it makes you realize just what you have back there on Earth. The Earth from here is a grand oasis of the big vastness of space. So as I watched this documentary and I heard their testimonies of their eyewitness accounts, I too became captivated by our blue marble, as Broman called it. So Broman, called, the captain, called it the blue marble. I was in tears, realizing that this is truly our home, the planet that Yehovah has made for us to live. And the flat earthers are trying to steal this from us and offer something so much less in quality, construction and beauty. If you have always just known that the earth was round and it has never crossed your mind that other people thought <laughs> differently, this may not impact you like it did me this week. So I've always known that the earth was round, right? It's that irrefutable truth sort of thing. Um, but wading through the idea that the earth is flat, I felt like I had slipped into a black hole. But then the unexpected happened. The eyewitness accounts of these three men pulled me back out of that black hole into the beautiful reality of where I actually live. And it's not on a flat earth, nor in a computer program. No, it's on a beautiful blue ball. 
So the documentary Earthrise, the first lunar voyage, continued to capture the moment inside the capsule where we can hear the astronauts as the first humans ever to see our planet. It's the only thing in the entire universe, all this inky black void, the Earth was there with a beautiful blue hue to it, the blue marble. That's, that's what it looked like, a blue marble, a blue wagon. This is how it went, quote, oh my God, look at that picture over there, wow, that's pretty. Anders clicked off a black and white shot and then Lovell gave him the color roll and he slapped that on the back of the Hasselblad camera and then took the picture that probably became the most famous picture of the decade, if not one of the most famous of all the century of the earth rising beyond the moon. That is still the picture that really sums up this electrifying experience of that flight. That there were human beings who had taken a monumental step away from home. And Anders came to the realization, even during the flight, where he said, my God, we've come all this way to study the moon. And it's really the sight of the earth that has the most impact. It's almost as if we are discovering the earth for the first time, end quote. So on the ninth orbit around the moon, the astronauts did a final live TV transmission from their spacecraft. As the camera faced the rising Earth over the lunar landscape of the moon, the crew shared reading the creation story of Genesis. We are now approaching uh, lunar sunrise, and uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. <laughs> God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, Close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. And then, as I heard that, by then I was completely in tears and on my face. The footage in the documentary I watched showed the command centers of NASA and Houston as, in, as silent, that the whole rooms were completely silent as these astronauts read the creation story. The inhabitants of the earth stopped everything they were doing and listened to the creation story read by someone who was looking at the entire ball of the earth. They could see the earth and they were reading the Genesis story as a TV transmission from their spacecraft down to the inhabitants of the earth. Three men. <laughs> so how could you read anything else at that moment but the creation story, right? I wish they had known his name. I wish they had been praising his name out loud to the inhabitants of the world for sure. If this was a hoax, do you really think that NASA 
would read from the Bible during a show, a broadcasted show? I don't think so. <laughs> the narrator in the documentary commented that this was the first time, quote, humans shared in the event at the same time as it was happening. This is true. I felt like I was sharing in it even though it happened 53 years ago, the year before I was born. It's beautiful. Talk about witnesses. On December 26, 1968, the crew gave one last broadcast from the spaceship before re-entry. Here's their quote. We are coming up on a view we really want you to see. It's a view of the Earth. As I look down on the Earth here from so far out in space, space, I think I'm feeling like travelers here, that I have been on a very long voyage away from home and now we are headed back home. And I'm proud of this trip, but still happy to be going home and back to my home planet." End quote. So these are eyewitness accounts, people. You cannot discredit them. If you don't believe me, then you can go to Google and search it out yourself and you can hear their own voices document what they saw. So in the film Earthrise, the first lunar voyage, the narrator says, quote, the impact of seeing the Earth as a planet, as a very small, distant, fragile looking ball in the blackness of space, that moment is a moment that ranks up there with any. The real legacy of Apollo 8 was to let yourself be, to let you see beyond yourself and that the real impact of Apollo 8 was that we had a perspective that was a mountaintop experience for all humanity." End quote. Now, as I've already mentioned, uh, you know, the uh, environmentalists and the New Agers and Mother Earth and all that stuff and Gia and all that stuff, they've taken it, they've taken what these men witnessed and they've used it for their own narrative, their own agenda, their own religion. They're pointing their heads in the wrong direction. But here, um, as believers, uh, we, like I said before, the rain falls on both the wicked and the righteous. So the images of what these men saw, their testimony falls on the wicked and the righteous wicked and the righteous. So what the wicked do with it is going to be wicked things, but what the, what, what the righteous do with it is going to be righteous things. And this is what I want to do with their testimony is do a righteous thing and show you these eyewitness accounts and actually try to help you see that they are true and that the narrative of Flat Earth is false. So the narrator uh, had one version of what they thought the impact was of Apollo 8's mission. But I say that the real impact of Apollo, of Apollo 8 was those three first witnesses of Yah's majestic creation of Earth being in the shape of a ball proves and lays to rest all previous theories of what the shape of this world is. That's what I think the most biggest impact of these three witnesses are. And again, like I said before, uh, Yehovah takes witnesses very seriously and he takes people who don't uh, accept witness, eyewitness accounts. He has some pretty stiff consequences for not accepting uh, eyewitness accounts. Hundreds and hundreds of people worked on the Apollo project for years. Thousands of people saw Apollo 8 launch with their own eyes. The spouses of the astronauts, the friends and the family, they saw it too. The TV transmissions, the testimonies of these three uh, astronauts who had spent four days in space and over 19 hours orbiting the moon. And by the way, four days in space and over 19 hours orbiting would not be possible on a moon uh, that the flat earthers claim is only 37 miles across. Yeah. <laughs> you cannot possibly look at the spouses in their eyes and the children and everyone who saw the things take off and NASA and all the, everyone who was behind Apollo 8 mission, you can't possibly look at them all and say you're all liars. Okay, calling people who are, calling people liars is a big deal with Yehovah. Yeah, you, you don't want to be like messing with this. You want true witnesses, you want to accept witness, eyewitness accounts on the base of two or three witnesses, and uh, you don't want to be calling people liars who are not liars, <laughs> right? That's a really dangerous road to go. All right, so as you watch these documentaries, uh, you cannot possibly call all of them actors. There's just no way. 
You can't possibly say that these guys uh, who took a Bible up into space with them and read it to the world, you can't say they were liars. I, I wouldn't want to stand in front of Yehovah in the end and have to account for calling these men liars. There's, you know, there's, you can't make this up. There's no way, you can't make it up. By the way, uh, these astronauts weren't shocked that the Earth was ball-shaped, actually. They expected it to be that way because it was that way. You know, history and science have proved that way before they went up. These were eyewitness accounts. They, you just can't dismiss their testimonies. They, you know, and on that line, I just want to say they didn't go up into the spaceship of Apollo 8 and look back and see, you know, a flat Earth rising over the <laughs> lunar landscape and go, oh, of course it's flat, or or wow, I thought it was flat. <laughs> they had nothing. There's no voice. You don't hear audio of them, you know, debriefing the shape of the Earth or discussing it at all. It's like, duh. It was. They don't even need to. They don't even mention it because that's what they expected to see and that's what they saw. So again, you cannot dismiss these astronauts' testimonies. If you do, you just might get the same end as those who rejected Caleb and Joshua's testimony about the Promised Land. And you'll be operating like the wicked governments who reject eyewitness accounts all the time. The courts and the justice system, they do this all the time. Uh, and in the end, it's not going to be good for them, right? Do you want to play this game? is my question to you. I hope not. I pray not. I pray that you take these eyewitness accounts very seriously. These are the first eyewitness accounts. So we have more since then. So I want you to remember that as Maggie wrote about, there are plenty of others besides America, the American government who were already exploring space. It wasn't just NASA. And by the way, NASA was not always an American, was not always linked with the government, okay? It started out as a private enterprise. But in the 60s, as Maggie says, uh, the Russians had already sent a capsule filled with a few animals on it around the moon. And in the, in the 60s, Russia was deemed by the world as a leader in space exploration. But Apollo 8 changed all that. And for me, the story of Apollo 8 changed me this week. I'm fascinated right now with our beautiful blue marble. This beautiful planet that Yehovah Elohim created for us to live in and take care of it. Uh, originally, that was our job, right? Originally, He gave this to us to take care of, and um, that is a sad story, but Yeshua came to be the second Adam to take it back, right? And to restore what humans gave away to Hasatan. Yeshua bought back with his own life, with his blood, and with all the work that he did. He's got it now. He owns that title deed to this planet, this ball. Oh, I am so excited about that. That makes me so happy. It makes me almost want to cry. just gone through so much and it's so <sighs> the people who live on it are so wicked and it's so not all that Papa intended it to be and it makes me so full of joy the joy that just doesn't go away because I know <sighs> that Yeshua has that title deed now And he's gonna come back and he's gonna put all the wicked governments under his feet and he's gonna restore Yehovah's law. He's gonna bring his Melchizedek administration and um, he's gonna engage us in restoring this world. And we get to actually operate as little kings and little queens in the way that Yehovah originally intended. And there is so much joy in that. And when I saw that blue ball and I really saw it with fresh eyes this last week, I was just undone, like so excited and so happy that Yehovah didn't abandon this planet. And we're going to talk about this actually right now. It goes right into this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so flat earthers believe actually that we are the center of the universe. This is this goes hand in hand with what I was where I was just going to go. But when the 
astronauts of Apollo 8 saw the Earth from deep space, their reaction was quite different than the egocentric flat earthers. The team of Apollo 8 felt strongly that, that we are not the center of everything. They described it as in, this, in the blackness of this universe, here was this very, very tiny, tiny, tiny blue marble, almost like a speck of dust. If you get way out, like the Hubble telescope took a picture, it's like a little tiny speck of dust. They saw this little planet being all alone. But of course, as believers, we know we're not alone, right? We know that in a way, we absolutely are the center of the universe, not in the way that the flat earthers believe, but we are the center of the universe because Yehovah has deemed it so. So how has he done that? He's done that by focusing all his energy right now on saving this planet and its inhabitants, giving us all a way by which we may be saved. That is what impacted me so much this week. We are actually the center of his eye. Therefore, because he made everything, the universe and everything, and all the other planets and inhabitants of wherever, his focus is right here, which means that we are the center because he has made it so. Not because we want it to be so, not because the flat earthers think so, not because we're egocentric, but because Yehovah has deemed it so. Because he cares so much about this planet that he made and the people that he made to live on it, that he did everything within his power to rescue it and to save it. And we are on the path to deliverance. <sighs> That should make you so happy. You should just sit with that for a while. Let that be your happy thought. That's mine. So I'm gonna read my reaction uh, that I wrote last week. I gave you just a spontaneous one, but uh, when I saw the blue marble we call Earth through the eyes of those first witnesses floating in the blackness of space, I pondered our fragile life here and this beautiful planet that He, Yehovah Elohim, created and the dream that He had for it. It is truly a stunning creation and I am sure it is just a shadow of what it was before the fall. But when I think about all the atrocities that have been committed on this blue ball since the fall, it makes me sick to my stomach. This world should, doesn't feel like it should be blue, but it should be red, stained and smeared with the blood of, of, of each other as wicked humans and wicked governments continue in the ways of their father who is from the pit of hell, who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy Yah's creation, both nature and people and man, mankind. <sighs> that just makes my heart so sick to know that this beautiful planet isn't so beautiful anymore. As the astronauts showed video and pictures of the Earth, I noticed that yes, the oceans are blue, but the land seems to be brown. So shouldn't it be green? Maybe it has something to do with the color of the atmosphere and the color green. I don't know. At first glance, I say green is life and brown is death. Then on land is where most of the atrocities and the horrors take place. But in in case that is actually the way it is, it won't be brown forever, people. It will be green again. What impacted me the most was watching documentaries last week about Apollo 8 as I was pondering the incredible other center love that love is, that Yehovah Elohim is. How completely amazing that our sin did not deter him from creating a plan to rescue his beautiful blue marble and his creation, us. It's completely stunning. So I touched on this a minute ago, but basically, what is his plan? What is Yehovah's plan for rescue? If you have been a part of our channel for a long time, then you know what his plan of rescue is. But in case you don't know, he provided the perfect blood to wash us clean. Blood that doesn't stain, but blood that makes us white as snow. He provided living bread for us to eat, and living water for us to drink, Yeshua HaMoshiach. He provided the helper, the Ezer Kenegdo, the lifesaver to guide us and live in us and move us to keep His law. 
so that when we do stand in front of a court of law, if we have kept his law, then the fist of the law will not come down on us. We won't be under the law because we've actually kept it. And who is that Ezer Kenegdo? Who is that lifesaver? It's the Ruach HaKodesh, the spirit, the set apart spirit of Yehovah. This is the path by which he made. Right? It is unfathomable that the first human sold this beautiful planet to Hasatan for secret knowledge and to save themselves. But a greater mystery is the extent that love has went to create a way by which we can walk to be saved. It's not sloppy grace, people. We actually have to do something. You have to walk. Grace actually means, remember in my summer series, 2020, we talked about grace. Grace is a boundary. It's like an enclosure. And you've got to be in that enclosure to be safe. It, that's where grace is. That's what grace is. That boundary has been provided by Yehovah. It's amazing grace, right? This blue marble is the place that he sent his son to die, his only begotten son to die for us. And that only begotten son did all his work and then resurrected. And that's the point. The resurrection is the point because, because he resurrected and he overcame death and it didn't hold him at all because he was the perfect lamb. Therefore, everything is his. That's good news. That is so good news. <gasps> this blue ball floating out here in the middle of this entirely seems like dark universe. On this blue ball, to this blue ball, he sent his Ruach HaKodesh to live and work in us right now. She is among us. He sent his Ezer here. This is the place that he will live someday. So after all of that, and you can't say to you can't tell me that his, that we aren't the center of the universe because he has put all this energy and he's focused everything here. He's got his, he sent, he was here. He sent his son here. He sent his Ruach HaKodesh here. And he's coming, he's sending his son back to get us. And then in the end, Revelation 21, one to three says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from Elohim prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of Elohim is with man and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and Yehovah himself will be with them as their Elohim. Oh man, that is going to be a grand day. Yehovah Elohim is going to come and live with us. I dream about that all the time all the time and when that happens this planet will really truly be the center of the universe because Yehovah is going to be moving here so yes looking at the picture of our planet from deep space it, it does look like nothing that we are just a speck in the heavens and that we are all alone we are very small humans on a very small planet in a rather small galaxy in the midst of a lot of deep space and darkness lit with a little bit of light here and there from the stars and the other galaxies. But as believers, we know that we are not alone. We have the builder. We have the father, Yehovah, taking care of us, loving us, coming for us. So rest assured there is value to your life because of the creator's focus, not because of your focus, not because you wanted it so, but because he wants it so. Your father wants it so. You are the apple of his eye. You're the center of his world. Elohim's focus is on rescuing you. His focus is on rescuing me. His focus is on rescuing this planet. And because it has his focus, it is the center of his attention, which means it's the center of the universe. That is where the beauty of the smallness of our planet comes to life. If it was that this wasn't true, then yes, we would be all alone and it would be disastrous. Absolutely. Hell is not a boiling pot somewhere, but actually it is complete separation from Yehovah Elohim. There is no life separate from him. From deep space view of our earth, that is a sobering thought being all alone without him 
is hell. But we're not, right? So to end here today, I want to quote a couple of scriptures. Psalms 111, 2 says, Great are the works of Yehovah. They are pondered by all who delight in him. Psalms 33, 6, By the word of Yehovah were the heavens made and the host of them by the breath of his mouth. In Psalms 8, we see it says, When I behold your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. Motion. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? So my heart was rescued this week by realizing again that this epic story that we all live in and all the things that are happening on this little blue marble is being watched very closely by the family in heaven who created it and who created you and who created me and the path by which this little blue marble is going to be delivered. So may Yahweh bless you with clarity and may he rescue you from this lie of flat earth nonsense. So thanks for watching. Uh, we talked today about the blue marble and my reaction to it. You saw some tears and we talked about what it meant to be center of the universe and if that was right or wrong. Next time in video eight, we are going to look at phenomena that cannot be explained by the flat earth theory. That is going to be another very interesting get in the details thing. So phenomena that we perceive and we can actually observe with our own eyes that cannot be explained by flat earth theory. All right, stay tuned for more. So don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell and join our email and support us financially and go buy something at our store. And go down through all our videos and like, 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 and help us get up in the algorithms. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Okay.